Thank you very much, Tobias. And uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the session. I'm going to talk about the rapid continuous MR, which has been a major research component at the CAL. And uh, so you may wonder what is rapid continuous, uh, rapid continuous MR. I want to give you a little bit of background and how did we start with some history of this project. And uh, I want to give you an update of where are we now and uh, what are our future directions. So this is a slide I, I made many, uh, about seven or eight years ago about the uh, standard clinical workflow for the cardiac MI. And uh, I think it's still, work, it's, it's still valid today. For a clinical cardiac MI, what we need to do, we need to set up an ECD device to synchronize the, the, the acquired data. And we need to acquire images from different orientation and uh, with a 2D slice. And for each acquisition, we want the patient to hold the breath. And in case the patient cannot hold the breath, we have to repeat the scan. So the scan includes about uh, many, many, uh, probably dozens of breath holds, and the scan time will take about the 45 to 60 minutes. And it's pretty complex and cumbersome, and they include a lot of, a lot of a slap shot. This probably is the worst scenario, but uh, breast hold is commonly performed in other exams, for example, in the body MR, in the clinical liver MR, we also need uh, several or many breast holds during, the, during our clinical exam. And so we generate a lot of bad time. We are not really fully use the scan time. And uh, so the ultimate goal of this project, and we hope to have a change of our imaging framework, imaging paradigm, with a shift from the conventional cumbersome snapshot to a rapid dynamic and streaming process and we create a rapid continuous MR, we want to offer improved image speed, and we want to reduce the bad time during the scan, and we want to eliminate the threshold with some free running and the motion robust scans. So now you may know that why we, are, we want to do this. <clears throat> and the rapid continuous MR is not a new research topic. So I just want to give you one abstract, which is relevant to NWA is from then, actually in the presently in 1999. And the concept, you can see that the free running model or continuous data acquisition have been for a while. And, and the world have some other early work using parallel imaging to accelerate the cardiac MR. And I bet that the improving cardiovascular MR probably was one of the major motivation for the development of parallel imaging. And uh, in early days, we also have some other work to try to do this continuous free breathing DCMR of the liver so that we don't need a hold breath. We don't need to acquire different face with different slap shop, and we have a push button acquisition. But uh, looking back from today, it turned out that uh, those techniques or those work really didn't fly for too long. And one of the main reasons is that the image speed is too slow. So I think the main change came around to, uh, 2006 or 2005 when comparison was introduced to MRI. So comparison for some of you may know that it's uh, Good technique for acceleration, especially for dynamic imaging, when we have a lot of extensive correlation, especially in the temporal dimension. So uh, actually, NYU was among the earliest group to explore the use of a comparison for MR acceleration, especially for dynamic MR. This actually, if I remember correctly, this was uh, our first project for rapid continuous MR. It's based on Cartesian sampling, and uh, we are trying to do real-time cardiac imaging. So for those of you who don't know, who are not familiar with real time, we are trying to just do real time imaging while the motion occurs. So we don't need to freeze motion. We don't want to ask a patient to hold breath. So with this new technique, it's old uh, today, but we can acquire one slice of the heart, heart, uh, heart imaging with just one bit compared to the clinical standard, which requires one breast hold to acquire one slice. And uh, Around 2009 or 2010, and Siemens developed this sequence called the radio wipe, which is now known as a star, star wipe. Actually, the original developed is Tobias Block, who worked at the Siemens at that time. And they developed this so called radio wipe using a star, stack of star trajectory. So we had access to this sequence around two, uh, 2010. So we started exploring whether we can combine the comparison framework with this radio assembly. And this sequence also offers some option that's called the so-called gold angle rotation scheme, which 
means that we can acquire different radio spoke that they did by our so-called golden angle so that we can have some flexibility to resource the group the data into different ways. So although this golden angle uh, sampling scheme was proposed back to 2007, actually it was not really captured a lot of attention at, around the 2009 or 2010. And that bad that the majority of the radio works, radio MR works actually today use this golden angle radio sampling. So we developed this, this, this technique called the GRASP, stands for Gold Angle Radio Stars Parallel MR, including Gold Angle Radio Sampling and the Parallel Imaging and the Compressions to Accelerate the Dynamic MR. And uh, it turns out that this technique is very good for uh, contrasting has the MR as I'm showing here. What we can do is that we can shift from the conventional breast or slap shop to a continuous acquisition where we inject the contrast at some time point and uh, after the data acquisition, we can reconstruct the imaging into different temporal phase that as what, as what we want to answer different clinical questions. And uh, subsequently, we also extended the GRASP framework to a new version called XGRASP. And the main reason that we did that, if I still remember that I and the team, other team member, could not really make the registration work. The registration, image registration was still the most used the method at that, at that time for motion correction. And uh, it's not really robust, especially for large motion. So we want to find a, a better and a more robust way to address motion. So the idea of XGRASP is very simple, giving a motion average of imaging. If we know how the motion occurs during the acquisition, uh, acquisition step, we can use a motion singular to sort the data into different, to different motion phase so that we can resolve the motion instead of correct for the motion. And of course, we are generating some artifacts, but we can apply for uh, apply a dynamic comparison and reconstruction here to remove the artifact. This is a very simple example, but the XD grasp has been applied for different applications, including the body MR or cardiovascular MR. And uh, I want to give you a few examples that how our early rapid continuous MR research is making a good impact. And the first one, Sorry. The first one is the clinical translation of the grasp DCMR. And after the development, uh, Tobias and the team actually built a software tool called the Yara, and that can translate this technique into the, into the clinical practice, which has been used in our clinical routine until today. And right now, we are scanning about 32,000 cases per year, and we have a large database. And it's also available on the latest Siemens scanner right, right now. And the next one is that Siemens actually developed this real-time cardiac CMR, which is similar to what I proposed before. And uh, there's no direct con connection, but they actually implement a framework that is similar as what we did, although with a different uh, specific constraint. As you can see, that's real-time free breathing MR is very robust to arrhythmia that we don't need to worry about the irregular heartbeat or for this sick patient who cannot hold the breath. And uh, we also combining our XD grasp reconstruction with some 3D crucible radio sampling. So that we propose the framework called the 5D whole heart MR, which includes the 3D spatial dimension plus one dynamic dimension for the cardiac motion and one dynamic dimension for the respiratory motion. So here, instead of correcting for the motion, and we are trying to reconstruct the, 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 the motion in an extra dimension. So this work was in collaboration with some collaborator from uh, Switzerland, and they have been actually done a lot of work, although we are not really doing this work too much. And the next work I want to highlight is that the x framework actually has generated some new concept. And this one is called the 5D flow, which was proposed by research at the Northwestern by uh, Lilian Ma and the micro marker. And they try to extend the 4D flow into 5D flow so that we can also visualize the motion pattern change along the rest of the motion dimension. And they have done a lot of very impressive work to show that this can give some very valuable clinical information. So that, this is a summary of our early work. And I want to give you some more recent research on this topic we have been doing. And uh, the first one is that following the development of GRASP, we now have a new version we call the GRASP Pro. And uh, the motivation of this project is 
is that we want to address an important question that is the motion. And although X grasp can somehow address the motion, and the one challenge is that we need to detect the motion, but the motion detection could be challenging if we want to make sure that it works for every, every patient. And a very simple way to address motion is to just go faster. <laughs> if we can go faster, that the temporal resolution is less than one second, and we actually don't need to do any, mo uh, any motion compensation. And the motion will be resolved a long time, naturally. So this is a grasp pro technique is the combination of this so-called low rank subspace constraint with the temporal sparsity constraint so that we can really push the temporal resolution to be, to be very high below one second. So, and uh, another extension we recently have is a so-called live view grasp. And for those of, those of you who do iterative reconstruction know that standard reconstruction is quite slow. So if we want to translate this technique for some application like the image guided uh, treatment, we, we want that the imaging can be immediately available. And especially the 3D imaging, we want to have a very low latency so that we can guide the treatment precisely. And so this live view grasp is a technique to address this challenge. So it's based on a two three, it's based on a two step. So the, for the first step, for example, during the treatment, and before we start the treatment, we can acquire a 4D motion database using the grasp of pro technique. And for each 3D imaging in the motion database, we are creating a navigator or this projection, and we now call it footprint. And if you look at the image, do this just like the footprint? And this can be uniquely linked to each 3D image in the 4D data set. And during the second stage, which can be performed during the treatment, for example, in the radio, uh, uh, radiation, uh, MR guided radiation therapy, we can just do a second stage in the B-mount state. And during this stage, we don't require acquire the 3D imaging. What we do is to only acquire the 2D motion footprint. And we, what we do is that to match the newly acquired motion, uh, motion footprint with the with that, we generate in, in the motion database, and we try to find the best match, and that will give, give us the, the 3D image at this time point. And uh, we can keep going, and uh, we can generate the real-time image service with low image latency. And this way, we can bypass the conventional acquisition reconstruction steps, which are quite time consuming. So this is just one example to show you that this is the left, live view motion footprints that we can get in real time. And we can also get a live view 3D imaging just in real time. And we don't need to do any reconstruction and the acquisition, just a simple motion pattern matching step. And uh, very recently, we have been also thinking that whether we can do something called the longitudinal reconstruction. Because in the current clinical practice, we often have a repeated scan. For example, a patient may need to do yearly scan for the disease monitoring or to evaluate the treatment response. And with the current reconstruction scheme, and we really don't take those past information into consideration. So what we are interested in investigating, which has been uh, uh, working on by, by Jinja from, from our lab, is that if we put all the imaging available from the past 10 points together and do a joint reconstruction, uh, reconstruction whether we can improve the image quality. And I hope you can appreciate the difference here. In the top row is the standard grasp reconstruction. Don't get the impression that the grasp is not good. And here we are trying to push the boundary so that the standard grasp reconstruction is not good enough. So we are trying to improve them with the new reconstruction framework to explore the temporal correlation, not just within the scan, but across a large time scale. And <laughs> And uh, we have been also working on some self-supervised learning for MR deloising, especially the low field. And uh, you may wonder why this deloising could be related to the rapid MR. So with the worldwide interest in growing uh, for, this, for this low field MR, actually, it turns out that the standard image protocol may not be sufficient to ensure sufficient SNR. So in order to get the adequate SNR, we may need to prolong the scan time so that the scan time could be longer than what we usually need to do at high field. And in that case, we got the reduce SNR. And uh, Nicola, who is a PhD student working in our lab, and uh, has recently proposed uh, a new technique 
that can do supervised learning for MR Deloitte and low field. I mean, to me, this image are really impressive that we don't lose a lot of detail and uh, we don't need a high SNR reference for training self-supervised and uh, we can improve imaging speed through Deloitte and it also works for different SNR level. You can see different images, different SNR level. And we don't require a dynamic dimension to explore this low rank structure or temporal correlation for Deloitte. And uh, some of the new work that we have been working on is Deep Grasp, which is a project that uh, uh, Hao Yang, who is a PhD student in our lab, has been, has been done for a couple of years. And uh, the rise of uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence has been revolutionized the field of rapid AMA. And of course, we cannot miss this opportunity to improve Grasp with, with deep learning. So we have different versions so far. And uh, the ultimate goal is that to use deep learning to improve 4D MR reconstruction. And uh, we can use that for stand 4D MR, and we can also use that for 3D quantitative MR. And you can trade the 3D quantitative MR as a 3D dimension plus a time dimension reflecting the contrast change or some other uh, variable. And uh, instead of just doing acceleration, we're also trying to use deep learning to directly reconstruct the MR parameter from understand the case space, just to completely escape the conventional reconstruction step. And I give you one example comparing the GRASP Pro, the conventional GRASP Pro with this, this new technique. So for GRASP, conventional GRASP Pro, we can get a Im good image quality if you have a sufficient temporal correlation, right? Because compression really relies on the temporal correlation. And if we cut the scan time down, for example, to about a half a minute, we are losing image quality. And the beauty of deep learning is that it can really explore both the spatial, spatial correlation and the and the temporal correlation, which what we are limited in in comparison, in standard comparison. So with this deep grasp of 4D, and uh, we can still got a good image quality. And uh, I noticed the image quality is different from my screen, but uh, sorry about that. And we can still got a good image quality that is comparable to the long scan, even if we cut scan time down. So this is only the steady state imaging so far, but we expect that this can also be applied to dynamic contrast in SMR so that we can really speed up the reconstruction speed to make it more clinical, clinically feasible. And uh, this is deep grasp T1, which we add the inversion recovery uh, preparation into the grasp framework for T1 medicine. And you can see with the standard grasp T1, we got a good image quality with a, a long scan. But when we cut down the scan time, we actually are losing image quality. And with deep learning approach, we can still got a good quality for the T1 map, even if we cut down the scan time to about 30, up to, uh, to about 30 seconds. And uh, another good thing of this technique is that we don't need to do a conventional step, do a reconstruction first, and do a prime the fading second. And uh, everything has been integrated as a single step. So from the ensemble case space, we do a simple LFT to get the ensemble image and we directly generate the map we want. Uh, and uh, this is another extension we call Deep Grasp T1 Dixon. And you, you, as you can imagine, we are also trying to extend to multi acquisition so that we can do that in the, in the body, for example, in the liver. And uh, we can simultaneously estimate the different parameters. Again, everything is directly coming from anatomic images, low conventional reconstruction steps. We got the different water images and we got the PDFF and we also got this water T1. And I want to emphasize that the water T1 has really emerging as an interesting topic and it really deserves another competent session to discuss. Because for the for MR parameter uh, mapping the liver, I think we need to consider the presence of fat, which is a big confounding factor. And we are trying to reconstruct everything together with a single deep learning step. And uh, how about the T2? And uh, we have also been working on this so-called deep EMC T2. And for those of you who, are, who, who don't know what is EMC, it's called the echo modulation curve, was developed by uh, Loam Ben Elizabeth, who, who worked at NYU and who is law in Israel. And the basic idea of this is that for the standard spin, multi echo spin echo sequence, we cannot really just estimate the T2 map based on a simple exponential model because of the 
impact uh, uh, flea bangle. And so Lom developed this technique and we are trying to simulate the, diction simulate the dictionary to represent the singular evolution along the echo tree so that we can match the actual singular evolution to each, uh, to, to, to the dictionary to find the best match of the title map. It's similar to what uh, uh, I'm a fingerprinting does, but it's more focused on, on Tito map. But the challenge of this technique is that we need the cumbersome offline processing, although because we need to match the actual singular evolution to a dictionary. So although many radiologists are interested in this, uh, still it doesn't say a lot of a lot of clinical implement, implement, implementation so far. So we have been trying to use deep learning to improve this. What we are trying to do is based on the conventional EMC, we are training a neural, neural network to directly export, uh, to, to, to generate the T2 map or the PD map from DICOM images. And we, we can also cut the number of echoes so that we can increase the volumetric coverage or reduce SAR. And here we are deliberately trying to focus on DICOM so that we don't want to touch sequence, sequence so that it doesn't affect uh, the generalizability uh, general, generalizability of this technique, and uh, it turns out that we can really generate a good image quality with about three echoes. And I don't have a space to show you the conventional EMC result, but uh, the a lot as good as this one. So in the last few minutes, I want to give you an overview of the future direction that we have been thinking, not for too long, but at least for the next five years. And uh, I want to highlight three major points that we really want to pursue. And the first one is rapid MR with intelligent quantification. So I think the kind of trend in the rapid MR field is that we really want to do rapid imaging beyond just imaging speed. I think it's less meaningful to just push the acceleration, acceleration from R equal four to R equal six. But what we are really interested in offering is that whether we can incorporate a new technique that can be directly used in the clinical, and uh, whether we can provide more accurate information. So this is what I'm, we have been thinking. And, and the second part is that uh, our center actually has been using this radio sampling for over a decade. It has been our main sampling trajectory, but the radio sampling is not really a one-size-fits-all trajectory. It has, has some limitation, especially at the low field strings or in the application where we need the long preparation pulses. So what we want to do clearly is that we want to expand our grasp framework to a multifaceted sampling scale. And the first one is spectral sampling. You already saw some results from the spiral UT of the UTM of the lung, and that was acquired with spiral, uh, spiral sampling. And I think spiral sampling could really play an important role at low field streams. And it can also be used for other applications like a, like a diffusion. And we also want to pursue this propeller sampling. And we want to rotate the propeller sampling, which is the extension of the radio sampling with a wide band. And that can be useful for some application when we need a long echo train, like the TSE, which could be problematic with the standard radio sampling. And uh, some colleagues at, at CARE have also tried to investigate the use of those as sampling in quantitative imaging, like the MR fingerprinting. And uh, the third part is that uh, we have been thinking, we should really take advantage of the past information in our clinical practice to do some longitudinal reconstruction or longitudinal disease monitoring to explore those information or the footprinting. So the first target will be image-guided treatment. I will show you the two-step approach, which is kind of in a lateral scale, trying to use the past information within the same session. We have a two stage, and we are trying to use the information from stage one to improve the, or to, to generate the images in the stage two. And uh, in a large scale, we also want to try to develop a technique that we can explore uh, longitudinal information in a large scale, in the past scan to improve reconstruction or to improve the disease monitoring. That is something I want to give you some highlights. And with that, I want to acknowledge people in my lab and the funding support, as well as the collaborators within and outside NYU. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Lee, for this great talk. Very impressive progress. Are there any questions for, for Lee?
Maybe to start, I have one question on the longitudinal grasp where you take advantage of correlations between different scans. And I was wondering what would happen if you do this, for instance, in pediatric patients where the whole brain is growing and uh, the correlations kind of are not that strong anymore. Would this still work? Yeah, we actually saw some cases that we have some big change of, of, the, of the underlying anatomy. And uh, I think the really that will determine whether how much acceleration we can push. And for those cases, I think we probably need to be more preservative on the acceleration part. But in uh, cases like this one, which is good, and we can really push. And uh, I'm not really worried about the change like that because we are we have been we have demonstrated that we can address those change well with the standard dynamic MR, like in the cardiac CNI MR, we have a big change of the myocardial wall a long time. And that would probably just reduce the, the low run condition or the sparsity and um, we need to pay additional attention. And I do feel that in some application, like in the prostate and the, due to the different uh, uh, compression of the different organ, that could be more challenging. So right now we are focusing on the brain and the liver, both of the organs could have less, less, less change compared to the, to the prostate. Like, Okay, thank you. Maybe one quick follow up. Oh, no. Mariana, go ahead. T2 imaging. Um, oops. How, what are the times that you are uh, planning to have and what is the resolution that we can achieve in the brain? You, you For mean, the T2 mapping that you're describing. You mean scan time, right? Did you ask? Yes, scan time and resolution for the brain. So right now the protocol takes about uh, between four to five minutes and without the acceleration, actually with graph acceleration. And uh, we are trying to, we are not trying to push the acceleration at this moment, because as I mentioned before, the reason that the, we want to first make this technique available to the radiologist. So we try to avoid the change of the sequence so that we don't need to consent the patient. This will, stand, this will stay as a clinical sequence. And uh, we can steer incorporate the additional acceleration into acquisition that for sure we can do that. But the only probability that that will also result in a research sequence, which could be harder to translate into clinical. And the beauty of avoiding sequence modification is that we can probably just move the sequence, move this technique for other windows. For example, we are trying to develop a technique at the Phoenix, and uh, we can just get the sequence from the Phoenix, and we can just uh, use this technique there. Are there other questions? Maybe just one quick um, comment on your question to be us about, you know, do, would you trust a longitudinal reconstruction over um, multiple, you know, time points separated by a long distance in time if you have, say, a developing brain? I think it leads to a really interesting question about how you represent motion and change, right? So we're using low rank methods that can kind of learn um, what relevant changes are. Nowadays, we have access to machine learning. So presumably we can train neural nets that are sensitive to certain types of changes and which are sort of blind to others. And so it, it, I, I'm actually quite yeah. confident that it can be done, but I think there's a lot of interesting work in figuring out how we compactly represent changes we're interested in. Yeah, but I, as, as I said, I didn't really realize that we have such extensive information along the longitudinal time scale. And uh, I think uh, we need to find some way to explore those information. That is something we are thinking right along. Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank Dr. Li Feng again.